Hello and welcome back. Like most photographers, I believe a photo isn't a photo until it's printed. And using the guide that we'll cover in the next two videos, we will show you the ultimate guide to printing your photographs. And you too can produce beautiful fine art prints like this that you can hang on your wall. The first thing we're going to look at is the different types of photographic paper. Looking at the characteristics of paper, there are five important things we need to think about. Firstly, and most importantly, is the colour of the paper. Here I've laid out the papers against a white background, which is actually photocopy paper, which, when you look at it, is actually quite a cool colour paper, whereas we've got a range of high-quality printing papers, ranging from a very cool tone, uh, resin coated paper through to some fine art papers uh, and I'm just showing you here the differences in the colour of the paper. Uh, many people when they start printing initially print using uh, high gloss resin coated paper and that has certain characteristics uh, such as a very good colour gamut or range of colours that it can print but the surface quality is not ideal for displaying or mounting your prints. Uh, it doesn't have any dimensionality or apparent depth in the image, whereas some of the more interesting fine art papers have a lot better characteristics. So let's move from the one at the top here, which is a Canson Aquarelle, which is a high quality, very warm tone, highly textured fine art paper. It's here printed um, using a portrait, which is not the ideal use for the print, something like uh, this would be more ideal, uh, such as a landscape or architecture or one of those types of images where the high texture of the paper really comes to the fore and helps to introduce that elusive third dimension that we're looking for in our prints, the illusion of depth. So you can see there that compared to our white photocopy paper, this paper looks very warm, but of course our eyes adjust to the conditions and we ultimately perceive that as being white. And one other important thing to remember when you're looking at the highlights in an image, when you're looking at a print on paper, the highlights are going to be the colour of the paper background. So if you have a warm coloured paper as the background, the highlights are going to appear warm. Whereas if you're printing on a cool, cool coloured paper, the highlights are going to be cool. And you'll see here that this is the highly glossy surface with very poor dimensionality and you'll see that I've even torn that paper because I disliked it so much. It's such a flat paper that most people start printing on that and then progress through to things like, let's look at the other one here, Canson Platine which is a satin finished paper. If I move that you may be able to see the slight texture in the surface and it also retains a more neutral tone and a very good colour range. And then um, a paper that is very popular with uh, photographic artists, uh, particularly those who exhibit their work, is a Canson Rag Photographic, which is a super fine matte surface paper, ideal for mounting behind glass, has a neutral uh, colour to it and a, an incredibly flat soft surface that holds details very well. And then we can move into things such as equivalent to addition etching by Canson or Aquarelle that have more texture and are useful for some other techniques. And just comparing those with the so-called natural white, you can see that most printing papers are actually a warmer colour a more natural warmer colour. The dimensionality is just totally lost in the resin coated paper whereas something like this will give you much more of a sense of depth. So the first characteristic we are concerned at, about with paper is the, is the paper colour. The second one is the surface whether it's smooth, slightly textured or highly textured. If you're looking for a paper that is a good middle of the road safe option either something like the RAG Photographic or the Canson Platine or the equivalents in Ilford, Epson or Canon uh, will give you probably the greatest usability and probably safe to use. But um, 
the high gloss papers really just don't have the characteristics we're looking for. And then of course the third characteristic is I've mentioned already whether it's a matte paper, a satin paper or a semi-gloss or gloss surface will affect things like mounting it behind glass and so forth. Most fine art photographers that I know use something with a matte surface or with a very fine textured surface for their prints. And the fourth characteristic we need to be concerned about in thinking about choice of paper is the base of the paper. All fine art papers are based on using 100% rag, cotton rag and the only one that is not using a natural product is something like the resin coated papers which have a plastic coating over them which traps the ink below the surface and while they're tough and resilient they don't have that, dim that elusive dimensionality. So the surface or the material the paper is made from and the surface finish will determine the ink set that's going to be used which is our fifth characteristic. Some papers such as these ultra matte papers and fine art papers require the use of a matte black ink and matte black ink does not have the same uh, depth of black that the photographic black ink does so that when we're printing on these sort of papers we are going to need to make some fine adjustments which we will cover in our workflow for making prints. So the five characteristics of paper are the paper colour, the paper surface type whether it's smooth textured or highly textured, the paper finish whether it's a matte semi-gloss or high gloss, the base that the paper is made from, whether it's a rag material or an artificial uh, plastic coated paper, and that will determine the type of ink set used and then we may need to make some fine adjustments to our print uh, in the process of sending it through to the printer. So let's move on now to looking at setting up the profiling and the viewing conditions for preparing to make our print. An important part of setting up your printer and your monitor for producing fine art prints is to set up the colour management. Now this can be a bit of a boring topic for some people, so we'll try and move through this fairly quickly. Firstly, when we're using uh, something like Lightroom to export our images for further editing in Photoshop, we need to tell Lightroom how to export the files so that they can be read and using the correct settings for Photoshop. So to do that in Lightroom we go to Edit, Preferences and under External Editing you'll see here that our program for editing is Adobe Photoshop 2021 and in the file format we want to export the file as either a TIFF or a Photoshop file. It doesn't really matter which one you use uh, TIFF or Photoshop but what we do want to do is we want to tell Lightroom how to assign the color space to our file and if we're going to do any additional editing in Photoshop we want to export it in ProPhoto RGB color space the larger space available to us which gives us the maximum flexibility for editing and if we're using ProPhoto color space we need to be working in 16-bit uh, type of file and that gives us again the greatest capabilities of adjusting tonality and colors and lastly and this is important if we're going to be printing is we want the output resolution set so that we can determine our print size uh, from Photoshop and Lightroom and if you're going to be printing on an Epson printer you want to export the file at 360 pixels per inch or if you're using a Canon printer you need to use 300 pixels per inch. Now you can resize the image in Photoshop and that's what we will do later on but at least by setting up these settings initially you can get the image somewhere close to the resolution you want. So that is your option for then exporting the file into Photoshop and we would then do that by going to edit in Adobe Photoshop and in this case this file has already been saved as a Photoshop file so we want to edit the original file. Once an image has been uh, edited in Photoshop we do not want to do any further editing in Lightroom. Once it uh, has layers 
and other settings applied in Photoshop you need to do all further editing in Photoshop so we would do that by going to edit original click on edit and then the file will open in Photoshop which I have done over here and the file is now opened in Photoshop ready for any further editing so that's the color management between Lightroom and Photoshop and when we go to Photoshop we need to set up a couple of things to make sure uh, that we handle things correctly and when we go to Photoshop we need to go into the edit menu and choose color settings and that will open a menu that will then give us a whole bunch of other options and just to remember we've exported the file as a Profoto RGB file and yet we're telling Photoshop our working space is Adobe RGB and that is because this photo is being edited on a high quality ISO monitor which covers pretty much 100% of the Adobe RGB color space and so we want to work in that color space even though our image contains more colors than Adobe RGB can display but that's not a problem because we can convert the file on the fly using Photoshop into um, Adobe RGB color space so we can view the colors as accurately as possible so don't get confused about the different color spaces having the larger color space to work with gives us greater flexibility but we can't always see all of those colors and those other settings most important is if you have an image with a missing profile you need to check that before you open it because if you automatically assign a color space that's the wrong one for a file you may end up with odd colors so let's just get out of that and now we have the color settings correctly uh, set up for editing between Photoshop and Lightroom and when we get into the workflow for the actual printing we will show you how the, the print settings and the color handling is adjusted at that stage but for now we have our two pieces of software Lightroom and Photoshop working together to give us the correct colors two other things to remember when we're editing and saving our files from Photoshop this file that we opened was already saved as a Photoshop file but if you're opening a raw file it will still appear here in Photoshop with the raw extension to it but when you click and decide to save the file you would go file save as and in the save as menu it will automatically set up the file to be saved in the chosen format either Photoshop or TIFF and then obviously you give it a file name and save it in whatever location you're planning to do so so um, when you do open the file it still retains the raw extension but when you want to save the file it will save as the file format that you've selected and one other important thing to make sure that you set up in the preferences not the color settings is um, in the file handling option of the preferences menu to make sure that the files are always going to be able to be read in Lightroom or other software this box by default for some reason comes set at ask and I don't know why they do that but you always want to make sure that you maximize Photoshop and Photoshop big file compatibility so that Lightroom and other pieces of software can read those files so that's the only other thing that you need to worry about in setting up the color in the handling between Photoshop and Lightroom the next thing that we need to think about in setting up our images and our software for printing is to calibrate our monitors correctly I mentioned previously that we could use something like the calibration target for uh, a device such as the data color spider to do a test print but before we do that we really need to set up our monitors to the correct profiling and unfortunately most monitors are set up incorrectly out of the box and they don't come with appropriate calibration uh, and this image is being edited on an ISO high quality monitor and it has inbuilt hardware calibration so that we have maximum flexibility for calibrating and setting the characteristics for our images now there is an ISO standard for editing images and that is quite different from what you will probably have seen elsewhere and the important standard for this is ISO standard 
3664 and it sets a standard of 6500 degrees Kelvin, a brightness of 80 to 100 candelas and a gamma of 2.2. Now you'll see here that I've actually changed this to a white point of 5500 because pretty much all of my editing is going to be geared towards making a print and 6500 I believe produces a color temperature that is just a little bit too cool and we could go back here and have a look at that uh, by just clicking on these other profiles that have been preset you'll see here that the image has changed color quite a bit that's at 6500 degrees Kelvin and set at 80 candelas but if we went back to 5500 degrees Kelvin you could see to my eyes at least in my environment that 5500 degrees looks a little bit more natural but when we come to printing we have a different set of calibration numbers we need to adhere to and that's because when we're printing on paper we're printing onto a surface that has a lower contrast ratio than a, uh, than a computer monitor and the contrast ratio of paper is something like 200 to 1 and a monitor that is set too bright will give you a, a print that's going to look terrible and way too dark so to match our monitor to the characteristics of paper we need to go and set up a printing uh, profile and that is uh, the ISO standard for that is uh, ISO 12646 and the important settings here are that we have a color temperature of 5000 degrees Kelvin and that closely matches the warmth of those neutral tone papers we had a look at initially and so that we can match our screen as closely as possible to the color of the paper but the important thing here is 80 candelas is the brightness level and if we compare that to the contrast ratio of paper the uh, numbers work out that 80 candelas gives us the closest match for uh, our print surface and our print brightness so that while you may consider initially editing in a, in a profile that is a brighter and cooler temperature when it comes to printing you will need to change your profile to that and then make some further adjustments for the printing so having done that uh, if you have an ISO monitor you know that once it's set it's going to be consistently correct but if you don't have uh, this sort of a monitor you may be wanting to use something like the data color spider or there are other brands available uh, my second monitor is a Dell which is then calibrated using the data color spider um, and there are other devices that do a similar job and in in this piece of software you will see that um, they recommend 6500 as the white point but again we've determined that we want 5500 and also interestingly when you look at the brightness settings they recommend 120 candelas as the brightness level which again is way too bright 80 to 100 is the preferred option to make sure that you keep your brightness and color as close as possible to the correct outcome and you can step through um, the various options using the uh, calibration settings for the other piece of software so getting the color calibration and getting your monitor to the correct settings is going to go a long way towards being able to produce a print and as we've used this example of the test image we could then go and print this using the workflow that we'll demonstrate in part two of this uh, video we can print this and then compare the finished print to the image on screen and we should be able to get very very close to the same result now the last key to setting up color management on our computers ready for printing is to obtain the right ICC profiles for your chosen paper now if you have uh, an Epson or a Canon printer when you install the printer software it will install a number of profiles for basic range of papers but if you're moving on to using some other third-party papers you will need to find the profiles for them and reputable manufacturers like Canson and Ilford provide profiles if you're buying your photographic printing paper from a well-known chain uh, office supply store that offers you a very cheap sort of paper but no access to printing profiles you're going to be wasting your money so looking at a website such as Ilford's you would log in there 
uh, choose the paper range, choose your printer. In this case, I've selected an Epson uh, P800, which is a current printer, and then you have the appropriate profiles available for the paper that you have chosen to use. And you can download these profiles and then install them. Same goes for looking at, for instance, Canson. You would firstly select your printer brand and printer model. Again, if we look at the um, uh, printer that we're looking at, the Shaw Color P800, and then you will see here, you can just tick the ones you want and download them. And it also gives you information here for the media settings that you need to set up in the printing uh, software when we move into that section. I will demonstrate that, but you will see here, it tells you, for instance, in Australia, uh, if you're printing with this particular paper, Canson Aquarelle, the media setting in the printer software is Velvet Fine Art Paper, which is the Epson equivalent to the Canson papers. So once you've done that, you've downloaded the, the uh, profiles. I will show you now how to install them on a Windows machine. Once you've downloaded those profiles for the selected paper, you'll need to install them. And so normally they would be found in your downloads folder, but I've actually moved these into another folder for convenience. Uh, and you'll see here that I've got a vast array of profiles that have been in, uh, downloaded over the, over the time. And so you would locate the particular profile you're wanting to install. Let's just go back and let's assume we're uh, looking at something like the Canson profile for the P800. You'll see here that there's a range. All of Canson profiles come with the, with the uh, prefix CIFA, Canson Infinity Fine Art, and then the code for the printer type. This is a, uh, an Epson 3880, but we are going to go for the P800, and let's say we're using the Aquarel profile. It has the prefix Aqua, 310 is the weight of the paper, and the, finally it mentions MBK, that's for a matte black ink set. Simply in a Windows machine, you right mouse click and you just select install the profile and it gets installed into the appropriate folder uh, under the Windows uh, uh, folders on your hard drive. Um, if you're working on a, an Apple machine, you would download these and it would typically be um, saved in your downloads folder. So using the finder, you would go to the downloads folder, find this particular profile and then for convenience either copy it or drag it onto your desktop and then you need to go into your hard drive and find the library folder and then within that look for the color sync folder double click the double sync uh, the color sync folder to open it and then drag and drop the profile in there to install it and then in both cases once you've installed a profile whether it be a windows or a mac machine you will need to close Photoshop and reopen it because Photoshop looks in those folders to find those color profiles. So if we're going into our, our printer settings which we will come back to a little bit later on but let's just go in there now and we look in the print settings we'll be able to find under here the printer profiles. Um, these, this is looking at the folder on the Windows uh, part of the software that contains all of your color profiles. So uh, while you have Photoshop open, it won't reread any new profiles that have been added. You need to close Windows and open it again. And you'll see here, here's the profile, P800, Aquarelle, etc., etc. Away we go. So those are the profiles that you need to set up. And if you don't have the right setup, if you don't have the right profile installed, you are not going to get accurate color reproduction. Well, now we've got all those important things set up. Some of those things are a little bit boring, but they're necessary to get, uh, get correct before you can attempt to print. Uh, so now we're pretty much right to go and we're ready to then work through our workflow for producing the ultimate quality print and in part two we will step through that one step at a time.